So I'm super introduced to introduce the panels. Uh, we have Ramona Carton. She's the head of field solution engineering at Box. We've all heard of Box. Uh, we have Maria Paul Mero, and I'm trying to be very good with names. <laughs> She's an international sales engineer at Simrush. Jeremy Spiegel, I mean, a friend and does so many things here at Pre-Sales Collective. He's also the founder of a new venture for himself, which is called the Lower Techs. And Anderson Yu, who's a director of sales engineering and architecture at Front. So let's get started. I'm going to hand it over to you, Ramona. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so excited to have this conversation today. Um, I'll be uh, kind of facilitating, moderating the panel. Um, but first, I wanted to get uh, each person on the panel to give a little bit about themselves uh, with an opening question. So my first question, and I'm going to start with actually Jeremy, is can you tell us a pivotal moment in your career that led you to pursue leadership? Sure, absolutely. And hello, everyone who's out there across the globe. It's really an honor to be on this panel. Um, so I was one of those individuals who came into leadership a little bit accidentally. Um, I was a very strong and successful individual contributor for about a decade. And then I was asked to basically help co-found design and build a pre-sales organization within my company at the time, which was Pearson Education. Um, and so that first year for me was really an eye-opening and, dare I say, professional life-changing experience for me um, in terms of management and leadership. Um, it's kind of where I fell in love with the idea of people leadership. You'll hear us talk about leadership in a couple different veins today, um, people leadership being, you know, management being a construct of that, but also thought leadership. You'll hear about all of those things. For me, the idea of being able to help individuals who worked with me, help them problem solve, help them strategize, and having the kind of unique challenge of understanding that everyone on your team is someone different, and how do you, or how you were able to connect with them to get them feeling at their best and get them feeling at their most productive has been something incredibly satisfying for me throughout the years, so. I love that. I think uh, for me, it, it was a little bit different in terms of a pivotal moment. I didn't know I wanted to go into management, actually, or leadership. Um, it's something that I think was also uh, similar, and you'll hear from Anderson and Rhea as well, that they had a similar type of uh, aha moment or kind of someone kind of pushing them into the role. Um, but for me, I had been mentoring a lot of people from uh, as an individual contributor. Uh, it actually pushed uh, me to help rethink our onboarding program overall for SEs. Um, and it actually afforded me the opportunity because of what I had done in the United States to be sent to our EMEA office to kind of bring some of that over and to mentor um, and bring uh, kind of consistency across the org. Uh, my time there uh, was actually when I had a few different people, my manager, my director, um, as well as my mentees all talk to me about, hey, have you thought about leadership? This was something that you... Uh, we see some of these skills, some of these uh, traits in you. Um, and really when I thought back and reflected on what I loved or got the most gratification or uh, satisfaction from the past quarter, it wasn't something that I personally accomplished. It wasn't my own deal that I, I um, closed with my account executives. It was actually one of my mentees, uh, something that he took from a conversation of ours, he expanded on that, and then he got really good feedback from the client, um, and that deal closed. And once I uh, realized that I got a lot more satisfaction there, that's really what self, um, you know, from my peers, from my mentors, my managers, and then that uh, internal reflection that really made me uh, decide to pursue a leadership role. So a little bit similar, Jeremy, but a little bit different, but transitioning a little uh, to you know, once you actually became a manager, we'll have a different opening. Um, what was the biggest challenge that you faced when transitioning from an IC to a leadership role? And how did you overcome that? And we'll start with first with Maria, and then we'll go to Anderson. Yes, of course. Thank you so much, Ramona. Um, actually, yeah, my name is Mireya, and I'm actually leading a team uh, of sales engineers right now. I've uh, been sales engineer for over five years. I, like Jeremy, I kind of was started being a sales engineer just by accident almost. I was working at a company as a, an act, actually was a, a software developer and they needed people that was in sales that had more technical expertise. And so I was the person that was more willing to do something like that. And I just started my, my career. And of course I was the first person in the, in the department. So I needed to just build everything, right? 
Um, but there's a lot of information about that kind of stuff. So I don't think that was the biggest thing. I think the biggest challenge came when I actually had some people in my team and I needed to understand that they are not working for me. I'm working for that people. So it's not that I'm going to be like, oh, you do this thing for me, you do this thing for me. I had to change my mindset and be like, no, I'm working for you. What do you need to succeed, right? What tools I need to, or what pieces I need to move so you succeed on your role. And then we all succeed as a team, right? But it's not, you are doing this for me. I'm actually doing it for you. So if I assign something to you, it's because it's going to be good for your career, for your pipeline, for what you are, what motivates you, all that kind of stuff. So I think that was one of the, the challenges there and that one of the things that I had to learn. And then understand also that everybody has different ways of communicating. Everybody has different ways of learning. Everybody wants to hear the information in different ways. So for example, some people need a lot of context and some people are very direct. Like they're just like, tell me what you want and I will get it done for you. Some other people are like, why I need to do this? So you need to kind of understand what everybody wants or needs in order to have a more effective communication as a leader. So those were two things that I first struggled with. So I was not doing at all. I didn't read about it, didn't know about it, and started to learn from other people in the sales engineer community and some managers. And then I felt I feel like one, uh, once I started implementing all of this, then I was succeeding as a leader and not just being a manager, right? So, yeah. That I love that. It. Anderson, what about you? Yeah. Um... I mean, that was that was so spot on to, um, you know, people are challenging. We're all so unique and that that poses a huge challenge just as people who one have never managed like myself stepping in from an IC role to a leadership role. So uh, definitely a lot of things that uh, Maria was was talking about that really resonated with me. Um, you know, I think just just by way of introduction, Anderson here, um, leading solutions, engineering and architecture at front. Uh, and I think the journey that I have and maybe similar to many of you is joining a small company. I've, I've been looking at the chat and um, kind of growing, growing this function from nothing and taking like, how do you then actually grow a function from a, a super IC to actually being a leader, right? And I think a lot of the things that this panel is gonna to touch on today is super exciting and super relevant. Um, but I think the biggest challenge for me, something that Chris spoke to as well, building that career matrix. When you're a super IC, all you have in front of you is Greenfield. And so you just have to keep on working and a lot of opportunities kind of materialize out of nowhere. And I also think that kind of joining, you know, a startup, you have this capacity to just be a, a super generalist. And that's in some ways super motivating you, for you. But as you grow a team, that's not going to be everyone's vibe. Um, and so making sure that you build a career matrix, it, it was one of the first things that I did even before I became a leader was to contribute to that because it didn't exist. And I think the hard thing is how do you build a career matrix when you yourself are either a first time SE, first time leader and building a matrix for someone like, for, for your own level and pushing it, right? Because you have to start to think about all the things that you're not doing today that you think you should be. And I think that's kind of a really interesting reflecting moment for, for, for myself. Um, I think the, the, the thing that I'll close with uh, is that was also kind of a, a challenge for myself was just recognizing that there's multiple ways to accomplish the same problem. I mean, we're all in solutions, so we're all generally solutions oriented. Um, and just being an IC, the first I see on a team going into a leadership role where you've also not had that leadership experience, it can feel like you, like all the things that you do are the right ways to do it because in some ways you've set the status quo, but, but we're all like, we're all different people. We all have different backgrounds, different experiences. And I think, um, making sure that you're very open to collaborating with uh, your peers who are now people that report to you or new people that you bring on and just always having that collaborative spirit in how you're approaching kind of problem definition into thinking about solutions, ways and strategies to engage customers. Like it's both a coaching opportunity for them, um, but also like a learning opportunity for you that you can then take and share back to the team. Because at the end of the day, um, yeah, we are all working for the business, but also for like the team. Um, so yeah, that's that was the biggest challenge or two of the biggest challenges that I faced. Um, back to you, Ramona. Yeah, no, hopefully that gave the, the rest of the group a little bit of background into all, all four of us and our, and our experiences. Um, kind of shifting a little bit. So I, I actually want to uh, focus in on a little bit of Maria's background. So uh, for any of you who don't know her, she's actually um, 
uh, joined and managed and built out SC teams at a few different companies. So really had to not only excel at one company that she started in and in a different role and then became a leader, but really was then recruited to other companies to do the same thing. Um, and then you have Jeremy here, who's actually been in this uh, industry in a leadership position for over 20 years. So really different successful um, uh, across different uh, decades, across different uh, companies. And Anderson is taking on different teams holistically. Um, myself, we're mostly focused on uh, the core solutions engineering team here at Box, but also have expanded from, I used to be in the West Coast managing to now I manage more of the East and Canada as well in mid-market through our strategic enterprise. So a lot of different challenges across all of those different types of new companies, segments, et cetera. Um, but Maria, I would love to hear from you um, about you know, what personal qualities or characteristics are essential for someone to be successful um, in a pre-sales leadership role? Yeah, so that's that's actually a, a really good question. And I get asked that a lot. Um, so for me, it was pretty straightforward. I think someone that is a leader in the pre-sales industry has to have two what I call pairing skills, right? There's sometimes that there's so people that is really good at knowing the product, um, knowing every single detail, all those things. There's also sometimes that some SEs that are really good at selling and you know the value proposition and all these kinds of stuff. So you are going to be the person that is going to have that skill, right? Like knowing the product, even if you don't know every single detail of the product, but knowing the opportunities, knowing if you're working with partnerships, knowing kind of like the solutions in that sense, like how to structure a solution, not just all the nitty gritty. Um, you will also, of course, know how to sell it. And then you are someone that really, really, really cares about people. Um, because I've many times seen uh, people that is like, okay, I have a lot of knowledge about the platform. I really know how to sell it. I'm the best SE in my team. So I'm just going to go and be the manager because that's the, the natural thing that I'm going to go and do. And so I actually think that's not it, right? Like you, the other skill that you have to have is, do you actually care about people? Genuinely care about people? Do you and are you involved in their development? Are you helping them somehow? Are you always, I don't know, offering coaching for them? Because that's what I've seen a lot of people in leadership. They start offering some coaching to their to their peers. They start taking um, care of some projects that are really important for the company inside of the SE team. So you have to have these two skills, right? Like, really, of course, be really good at your job, but also really be willing to understand other people, work for other people, coach other people and put all your time and energy on them because that's what you're going to be doing essentially. And of course, looking for opportunities, but that is a main thing that many people don't really think about when they are going to jump into this uh, this role. And so many people, some people think, well, no, yeah, I care about people. Yeah, but what is the actual, what, the, what, what have you done? What are the actions you've done to show you actually care about people, right? If you've done them already, then you might be ready to go and lead other people. If you just are just thinking about it, then you might not be ready because you, you have thought about it, but you haven't done it, right? And that's going to be your role. So I think those two things are, are really essential for an SE leader. I love that. Um, I think that's a great way of, of phrasing it too, is really thinking not just are you, you know, are you you're caring about people? I think as SEs, we are so uh, focused on helping people solving problems and we really want to be supportive. But I think it's a different level. And I think you're talking about that really honing in on really what you think about, how you think about things. Um, Anderson, I know from your side, you've gone through a few different roles right before even coming to the SC team um, and leading that. So what's your, what's your take on that question? Yeah, uh, personal qualities and characteristics, man. So um, yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at my LinkedIn or I'll, maybe I'll just say do a, a brief recap, like no two no job that I've had kind of back to back has been the same job over the last 10 years until my solutions engineering leadership um, kind of stint. And um, I guess like in some ways, and maybe this speaks to to some of the folks that are on this call today in terms of how you feel is like you're always craving to learn more. Um, you're never satisfied with just like, oh, I've completed this thing. Like now what about this? Now what about that? Like and every part of the business just seems so interesting to you. I think that that um, that that ability to just be interested in a lot of things and being able to take that deeper um, and really just understand at the core like why, why are you interested in those things? I think that kind of a uh, sentiment is something that really resonated with me and that I've also really looked for as I uh, go through my interview processes to like look for people on 
my team. Um, but I think, you know, what, what I've heard even from some of the folks that are in the chat as well, um, is, is what we're talking about here is, is servant leadership, right? Like the, the difference between when I was, uh, an IC going into a solutions engineering role versus knowing that I was ready to be a leader was how I ultimately determined what, what was on my, like, my list of things that made me happy and I'll, I'll be i'll be transparent when i when i became an sc um i had a very frank conversation with my manager well i guess he wasn't my manager at the time but i was just like i really want to be in the spotlight that that's what gives me a lot of energy but then i think ramona similar to you where there was a there was a point where we were starting to bring on new people and i got a lot more enjoyment in making sure that they were shining that we were winning as a team that we were building the brand of the larger the larger organization versus my own personal brand that was when i was like okay like things are changing things are changing for me i've gotten my time in the limelight like let's 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 let everyone have that chance too and so i think that kind of servant leadership putting your employees first helping them develop into great people and also sometimes that that means developing them out of your organization, right? People are unique. That doesn't mean their career is always going to be in your in your function, and that's okay. Um, some of the other qualities that I think are super helpful, um, just thinking in frameworks. Uh, so um, frameworks or structure, like I know frameworks gets used quite a bit, but being a leader and having a structure that people can follow, I think a lot of times in our roles, it's the art and the science of it can kind of really mix in together. And so being able to like with structure communicate, what are some ways and strategies that you can approach things and being able to clearly distill that out in a way that people can follow, very helpful quality and characteristic. Um, and then I think the last thing uh, is, is being hyper observant for your team because you have to be, um, you know, in, in so many cases, the solutions organization is kind of seen as this hero that flies in and solves all the problems. And like, you know, how dare you give feedback about that person that's just saved your deal or that's helped you, you know, win that that opportunity. Um, and so I feel like a lot of the times, and especially these last cycles um, of, of feedback that I've gone through, you get nothing but praise. And so it's your job as a leader to be critical and observant and stay close to the work because otherwise, Otherwise, like, they're not going to improve. They're going to continue down this path that they've they've been on, and it's your job as a leader to grow them, right? So, um, I think that's a really hard task, especially as you have a, a larger team. But um, some of the things that that I think about as qualities and characteristics as a, a successful, not that I'm necessarily calling myself successful, but a pre-sales leader. Yeah, I think those are really good points. I think you know when we think about. Um, it's a, it's people leadership, right? That's what we're talking about right now. A lot of these are people leadership, which talks about being, uh, having that empathy. It talks about really caring about people. It talks about finding your successes through their successes, right? Um, when we're talking about the frameworks, things like that. I think one of the other really important qualities that we're, we're not, uh, we haven't called out as explicitly yet is at the end of the day, this is a people leadership role too. So you really have to be able to ha be comfortable having those uncomfortable conversations because at the end of the day, you want everyone to be super successful, but sometimes there is going to be that hard feedback that you have to deliver. Or sometimes it's about not letting the emotional outweigh the business side of it, right? So really being able to make sure that you can have those conversations and you can actually be straight up forward. Um, I think Maria talked about that. Some people learn to communicate in the way that your team and each individual needs to be coached or motivated. Um, and that's really a hard skill for some people to be able to have that type of conversation or be able to look above the emotional uh, connection to their team. Again, very important from that side, but really also it's your job to really push them to be their best and help unlock problems for them, unlock their potential. And some of that is great positive conversations. Some of that is the hard conversations. Um, and so, and I think Anderson actually right into his career as a manager had to deal with a lot of that because there was a riff at his company. So uh, in tech, we all know that that happens a lot, right? It's not even something that's your team is doing bad, but sometimes hard decisions get made at a higher level that you have to communicate down. Um, shifting, I think we, we talked a little bit about uh, motivating factors. I think Brea and Anderson both talked about that. But I love Jeremy, like you've been in this uh, role for you know a very long time. What are some of your motivating factors that keep you in this role? Yeah, so that's that's an excellent question. Um, and one of the th my primary motivating factor is also probably if there's one message all of you walk away from today is what we need in 2024 more than anything 
are people leaders who want to lead. Steve Jobs once said he felt the greatest leaders were super individual contributors who did not want to manage. I love Steve Jobs, but he's wrong. He's just dead wrong. Um, what keeps me motivating, what keeps me coming back at the risk of sounding trite is, is the people. It is under, it, it's coming back and knowing that each and every day, there's going to be something a little different. And this is, I'm going to, I, I talk a lot about the soft skills because I think that's incredibly essential. But if there's one kind of hybrid, soft, technical suite of skill sets that you really need in pre-sales, whether you're IC or leadership, it's what I like to call professional agility. And what does that mean? That means you may be going in one day and having C-suite strategic conversations and really talking about high level business and solutioning. That afternoon, you may be knee deep in building a proof of concept and knee deep in pr production specs, which are really far more technical and micro. And you need to be able to understand when you're in the macro or the micro, because really it requires different mindsets. And especially when you are a leader, the ability to make those shifts and adjustments are really, really key. Um, and I think what else keeps me motivating is also, I, Anderson touched on it. I, I, I'm at that point in my career where I get a real kick and thrill and satisfaction from watching others succeed, from watching others grow. Um, and as Anderson also said, um, I'm one of those people who can't just sit and rest on my laurels. I love challenges. And one of the things that I personally love that motivates me with people leadership is that whether you have a team of two or 20 or 25 or 200, no two people are going to be the same. How you connect with them, how you work with them, it's all going to require different abilities of empathy, communication, curiosity. Um, that's another big trait that you really want to have as a people leader because you want to understand your people and you want to want to understand your people. Um, and the closing thing that I will say is that another thing that keeps me coming back is that se depends on what research you read, 70 to 75 percent of people will say their biggest factor in work satisfaction is their manager. And I think if we all take a look at that, it's not hard to understand why soft skills are just so essential in making sure that you are doing well at people leadership and that desire and want to keep coming back and help others succeed is paramount. I love that. Um, I think that's a really good uh, transition and actually looking in the chat too, I saw Peter talk about how everyone should wanna lead, it's not just the manager trait. And I think that's actually where we wanna transition right now uh, into, you know, we're, we were just talking about people management, right? Which is people leadership, which is really focused on that. But there are a lot of different types of and ways to become a leader in your organization. And I think that's something that we all strive for and we all push our own teams to be leaders in their respective ways. Um, so um, one of the things that I think we're gonna shift a little bit is what are some of the signs that someone might be better suited in an individual contributor leadership role rather than a people leadership role. Because again, both are very important and you can be very successful and very impactful and have that still uh, that same type of uh, recognition or type of um, kind of impact on others in your team, in your organization, mentorship, things like that. So um, I actually would love because um, Maria has built out a few different teams at a di different companies. What um, are some of the alternatives from uh, two people leadership that you have helped coach your SEs on um, to do in the different organizations? Yeah, this is one of my of my favorite topics here uh, for real because I've had such good conversations around this topic with my teams, um, and we've come with like really good conclusions, right? Because when someone tells me, "I, I want to be a leader or I want to be a manager in the team," the first thing that I ask is, "Okay, why? Why do you want to be a leader?" And most people, when you start a conversation and start digging in, when you say, hey, tell me the truth, they want money, more money, or more recognition. That's normally, that's a lot of people's reasons, not everybody's. That was not my reason. Uh, that was, that's maybe not the reason that for people that we're here, we were here. But if you don't really want to be a leader, but you just want to scale, you just want those two things. And my conversations were around that. And so when someone says those two things, which are, hey, I, I completely agree. If you want that, you get that. But then you're not going to get it being a manager. You're not going to get it being a team leader in a way of like leading people. 
you're going to get in a different way. And so there's other ways you can lead teams because inside of a company, even inside of a, of a, of a or sales organization, you can lead projects, for example, you can be a team lead, which is not the same thing as a team manager. So you can lead a certain project and that will give you more money, that will give you some goals to pursue, that will give you some people to, to lead, but it's not going to be people to coach. So you will, you know, make sure that everybody is in the same page, you will do some calls with them, but you're not going to be coaching them. You're just going to make sure that everybody works in conjunction and everybody's like being like in a good sync, right? Um, some of the other roles that are like, I think a lot of people like is, for example, uh, product evangelist. That's a big, big one that a lot of people don't think about. But if you ask a lot of product evangelists out there, they most of them came from a role of sales, sales engineering or sales. Why? Because especially if you're a sales engineer, you can get really, really, really good at one specific product on your company or one specific functionality, get really good and understand how the partners work, how every single detail works, what the customers want, be the star for that specific product, and then become the evangelist. And being an evangelist is going to be being a leader. You're going to be the person that people is going to ask about that specific product. You're going to be in the marketing, um, you know, in some marketing calls. You're going to be in some decision-making calls. You're going to be in sales calls. You're going to be someone that is going to be someone that is an individual contributor, but you're going to have actually that leadership that you're seeking for and that more like importance and this other role that you're seeking for, but you're not going to need to manage a team. And a lot of people that starts that and goes that path, they love it. When I've discovered this with some people and they've been like, oh, that's actually a really good option for me. I was like, yeah, sure. And also having a team of people, you can also satisfy more people in your team because if all the, my, the people in my team are trying to be the manager, then everybody's going to be satisfied except for one person if I choose that manager, right? But instead, if we discover and, and, and tap all these other motivations, then I'm going to have one manager for this team. And then I'm going to have all these product evangelists. And I'm going to have this person that is going to lead these, these uh, different projects. So everybody will be happy. Everybody will be leveraging their skills in the best way possible. And they don't need to lead people. So I think asking those questions to yourself and being honest um, are things. And also as a leader, trying to really uncover these things on people in your team will make them succeed and also you yourself you're going to succeed so i think these for example are some of the some of the ideas that i've suggested my team and they've been really really successful when pursuing those instead of a manager role yeah i think those are really good points and different ways uh, and different approaches based off of what motivates that person right so if they're more interested in certain areas or different types of of things but i think one of the big areas that i would say in general if you're interested in being even more of an individual leader is really starting to up level yourself and thinking at a higher level and perspective so a lot of times as an individual contributor you're doing your book of business your deals your account executives you might be bringing in and building out your network but you're very focused on your scope and your kind of level where I really push my team is really thinking higher up. So how can you take some of the things that you're hearing, not just from yourself, but from your teammates, maybe from, uh, from your account executives, maybe from different, from the product managers, how can you put all of those things together and figure out where we could actually make a bigger impact or can I change something? Is this a problem? Is this something that we could capitalize on? Right. So both ways. Um, and that's really a way to distinguish yourself and be able to kind of hire up, see where are the challenges, where are the things that could actually shake us. And maybe that's actually creating processes. Maybe that's actually thinking through, hey, we've been successful in this vertical. How can we actually expand on this? Or how can I bring product together with the sales and our cl clients to really go into this area? So I would also say if that is something that you're interested in, like start thinking through how can you up level yourself? How can you start listening more to what you're hearing outside of just your scope and then be able to figure out other different ways of impact? Um, because that's where I've seen the most success and the most satisfaction from my team who are that type of leader. They become thought leaders in a specific industry or they built processes out in this or they're really being looped in for these strategic conversations with our C-level right? They are actually being pinged by our CEO because of the fact that they put X, Y, and Z together and they've coordinated different teams together from a grassroots because they've taken that um, higher up approach and really thought through what's happening outside of just them and their book of business. Um, so switching over a little bit and Anderson, I, I we had a prep session and Anderson said a great uh, um, uh, 
uh, a great point, and he said it earlier today, but I want him to expand on it. SEs are great generalists, right? We are. But I think that sometimes makes it harder for us to navigate and harder for everyone on this call to navigate really where do you want to go? So um, I would love if you can actually give a little bit more about how you identified your personal leadership strengths and areas for improvement early on in your career. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, when I joined Front eight years ago, I started as our first customer success manager, and then I became a product manager. And then I was going through my soul searching journey of like, like, I can't just keep on moving every single time I like fancy something else. And so, you know, one of the things that my, um, my CEO asked me to think about, which uh, you know, there's a, there's a question from Harsh about like a go-to framework is um, a zone of genius versus zone of excellent exercise. And so um, this is actually something that I use with my one-on-ones, especially as it comes to like monthlies or career development conversations. I think uh, one, just to what Ramona was talking about, I'll kind of circle back to that first. Being a generalist can oftentimes in a solutions world be viewed as just like such a positive but let's also understand that being a generalist can also be detrimental in some ways, right? You, you're you pulled into everything and you the bar, like in terms of the, the T-shape kind of person, the, like it can be a very high bar across the board for many things, right? We're working with product marketing. You could be a marketing whiz. You could be a, a great enabler. You could be a great product manager, great product sense. We could be great at a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that, and I think sometimes that can actually create more confusion for you as like, okay, look, I don't, like I've already done everything. The only path moving forward is to be a manager, right? So I, I really like kind of um, what Mar uh, Maria was saying about kind of like really pushing the why behind that, but just coming back to the zone of genius versus the zone of excellence, I'll kind of distill the difference there. The zone of excellent is, Things that you do well, things that people recognize for you, recognize you for doing well, but that you don't get energy from. And the zone of genius is all of that, but you do get energy from. You can just sit there, time will pass, and you're still energized at the end of the day. You can't wait to wake up and like keep on going. Not that you should wake up and keep on going with work things, but like, you know, you're just so excited to come back to it. And it just brings you so much joy and so much energy. And so I think when it's just such a helpful uh, helpful exercise to go through to one identify your own strengths like what are the things that you um what are the things that like you you want to be doing more of versus things that you can be good at but actually might be better suited for somebody else on your team to do if that is their zone of genius kind of creating those opportunities for your team um and I've kind of lost the lost the sauce in terms of the questions, but one last thing that I kind of want to talk about is um, another question that you can kind of ask yourself to identify potentially your per, your personal leadership qualities is just do a quick five minute reflection, like sit down, pen and paper, and just give yourself five minutes and think about the qualities of managers you've had before, right? Just like like what stuck, what sticks out to you, the good, the bad. Just go and do that exercise because what you'll really quickly understand is just like. What are the things that really resonated with you? And those tend to be areas that you might be able to do really well, right? Because you've, you've clocked it. These are things that like um, that matter more to you. And so because it matters more to you, wh where can you take that? Um, and where can you go with that um, in terms of your own leadership style and strengths? And then, of course, finding people on your team that make up the difference because, you know, as a leader, you don't, again, have to have the answers for everything. Build a bench of great leaders, not necessarily people leaders, but leaders within your business, uh, within your team. And therefore, you can kind of uh, raise the tides uh, for, for, for the entire organization and, and brand. I love that. Um, so we started a little bit at the beginning about you know our personal journey to, to leadership, how that happened. And we focused a little bit more about some of the motivating factors. What are some of the traits that um, as people leaders um, that we look for and we see? And we focused a little bit more about how you can expand on what the definition of leadership really means, right? So that's not just a people leader. There's lots of different ways. And I actually think that's what's great about the solutions engineering or pre-sales organization is that there are different ways of being a leader in your own uh, organization without managing people. And there's also a lot of different opportunities in different ways uh, to manage people. Um, and then I love how Anderson kind of came and said, here's how you can actually think through. Let me ask myself some critical questions to think through. Is this something that I want to go down the people leadership path, or I want to go down that personal uh, individual contributor leadership path? 
Um, and so the next thing I wanna do with the last three minutes, the last question before we'll, we'll go to all the great uh, questions that are in the channel um, is ask Jeremy, you know, as someone who's been in this role, seen a lot of people go through this, you yourself went through this, uh, this uh, experience. How can someone, once they've decided, I do wanna go down this path, I do think that these things are really important to me. This is where I wanna grow myself. How can someone pre actually prepare for this role? What are some of the things that is important for them to share with their leadership? What are some of the actions that they should be doing, responsibilities? Can you elaborate a little bit more of what you've seen and what you found successful? Yeah, absolutely. And what I'll do is really, uh, I'm going to elaborate on some of the things that I wish I had taken advantage of when I first became a leader and that I've seen others do now. Um, that is just really great. And so everyone's kind of touched upon it a little bit. When you are a leader, it's just as focal. Read, upskill, read, upskill more. There, I've already see it here in the chat. There are tremendous books about leadership, about thinking, about communicating. All these things are very, very focal to helping you as you continue your leadership journey. Um, because perfection is a myth. You will always be striving to just be a little better than you were yesterday. Um, the other thing is, you know. You really, I, I would, I would couch it as have a continued curiosity about your industry and organization. And and the reason I say this is because the more in managerial and, and people leadership you will get, the more you will be exposed to higher degree and level conversations. Now you will have a subset of responsibilities within there. But your impact can be far greater the more actual integral knowledge you know. So if you are in a leadership meeting and your CFO is talking about numbers or something, sitting in or, or reading the quarterly earnings, things like this will help you gain a better understanding of, from a macro standpoint, where is your company going? And one of your jobs as a leader is to take these messages that you may hear from up on high, the executives, and translate that back down into something digestible that is gonna be relevant for your team. That's something we really did not talk about a lot that I think is incredibly important is that there, one of the aspects of leadership is that you are going to come into times where what you need to do for your team um, may be in conflict with what you believe you need to do for your team because it involves something you are being asked to do by something within your business. Um, and being able to reconcile those and how you're able to communicate those things down to your team when it's less than stellar news per se, being able to continuously communicate that effectively and poised. That was the other thing that I will just say is just maintaining and practicing poise in tough situations will have a tremendous impact on how you lead as well. I love that. So we're right at the question uh, section. So we got a lot of really great questions from a lot of you. Um, we won't have time to answer all of them in 10 minutes, but um, hopefully we can answer some of them outside of that. Anderson had a few people who want your framework. So we're not going to go into that one, but they do want some of the frameworks that you talked about. Um, one of the ones, and this kind of goes back to uh, some of the harder parts about being a manager, right? Um, and someone asked, what's your best advice for delivering critical feedback? Um, and uh, it can sometimes be difficult to avoid the shit sandwich, sharing positives on either side of the negative. And I'm combining that with um, uh, uh, someone else asked uh, a question around if, can you provide specific examples of recent projects where your team's performance did not meet expectations and how you, uh, the steps that you took to address that to prevent them recurring in, in the future. So um, I'm gonna answer the, the shit sandwich one first, just I think going back to what we said at the beginning, a lot of uh, management is about, you need your people to know that you are in there for them. You are want them to be successful, which means building that set of trust and transparency and that they know that you are advocating for them and you have their best interest, not your own best interests. So I do think that that's really important before being able to deliver any type of critical feedback, you need to make sure that that's something that they are bought in, that you're bought in with them. And I think the second part that I, I think that a lot of people like to shy away from giving critical feedback, there's sometimes we do have where people mess up and that's okay, as long as you learn from those. And so I think sometimes if you sugarcoat too much, there's no clarity from them on what was actually wrong. So um, I think from my perspective, it's really about making sure foundationally you've set that trust, you've set that respect and you, you, they are bought in on you being a part uh, of helping them succeed um, and then being very transparent and very honest with it. 
But also making sure, to Maria's point earlier, you have already understood how they like to receive feedback. So asking that question up front of, is this something that they like to you know, do in one-on-ones? Is this something that they like to hear right away? Like there's people who like to have it in person or on video. There's some people who are like, I just want you to slack it to me. I just want you to get it to me as soon as it happens, because otherwise I'm going to forget what that was. So that would be kind of my answer is a lot of people like to do the, the sandwich, the compliment sandwich. People think that you're honestly, if you've ever received it before, you know that some, you don't think it's authentic. So I would say be authentic in how you're delivering it. Be very much on their side and also work with them, right. To go past that. Uh, I, I'm, yeah. Jeremy. If you I, I, I do. Yeah. I would also just say that, um, it's, it can be very easy to fall into the trap of doing these critical conversations the same way with all of your people. And as Ramona just said, you can't do that. Some people are going to want it shot straight to them. Some of them need a big buildup. Some need to have their screen off. However that is, there is no one right way to do it other than know which impacts and helps resonate with each of your individual team members the greatest. And that's the direction you need to go. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, I don't know if Anderson and Maria, if you guys want to add anything to the other side of the question, which is if your team doesn't, you know, meet expectations from a performance, how you kind of the steps you get past that to make sure it doesn't uh, occur, or if you want to answer more on the, the feedback side. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, on, on the feedback side, people have talked about radical candor. And I think one of the things, especially as a first time manager myself, it, yeah, like I, I think about like servant leadership and like oh do you you know not necessarily even taking that on on yourself as like oh i may like i haven't set you up for success um and just kind of biting the bullet and just kind of being radically candid about what's going on one make sure you do have evidence right i think sometimes in our roles you kind of hear especially as leaders you're kind of hearing it at, at a certain level but like you need to actually if you want to deliver feedback you need to get to the actual like meat and potatoes of like what actually happened and do you agree with that feedback based on your observation because you likely weren't in the room so like it's not easy it's like easy to just pass it on but then like when especially solutions folks you know there we, we love being in the details um you got to make sure like you actually know what you're saying <laughs> um and that that is defensible but then if it is like Honestly, I think a lot of times, especially career conversations too, I think those can be super hard. We're talking about people, people leadership. You can have multiple people on your team want to be into people leadership. And sometimes the answer is no, like there is no opportunity. And I think sometimes it's easy to just be like, uh, like, I'm not going to address this. Like, I know that you want it, but you're not asking me directly and I'm not going to address it because it's going to create this weird vibe uh, and weird relationship and I'm going to risk losing you. Truth is you're going to lose them anyways if that's really what they want and you don't have the opportunity and you're not talking about it. The thing that as a leader that you want to do is to get in front of all these things, right? The more transparent that you are with your feedback, with where you are with the business, with how you see their growth and, and their career, the better visibility you have and honestly probably the more honest conversations you'll be able to have with your ICs of like yeah I, i'm, I'm going to start looking okay cool thank you for that heads up like let's see if there's anything that we can do or know like how do i as a leader put manager hat on figure out how we can make this a smooth transition right it, you always get hit by the side the worst when you have it no idea that it's going to come so being more transparent um with your feedback with opportunities with anything um honestly i think is 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 kind of one of the big biggest learnings for me but also like uh like the way that i would think about like giving critical feedback not necessarily just about like the performance but like feedback about like where they're trying to go i love that um so one more question i'm going to ask actually i'm going to this question i feel like this is very appropriate for maria to answer um, so eh, what uh, specific challenges have you faced in managing remote employees or those in different countries? And how have those challenges impacted the team's overall performance and collaboration? This is a huge topic. I've seen this topic also in uh, the sub, uh, Slack channel, the topic management. I've seen uh, we were chatting about it uh, there. So it's very interesting. It actually, it, there's always going to be challenges when you are managing a global team. There's That's just it. You have to face it because... When you have people, you know, like in the in Asia, and then some people in the United States, some people in the EMEA region, that just there's going to be some challenges in terms of like the the time zones, and so that you just have to face that, right? So 
one of the things and very, very important thing is for everybody to be okay with um, a sync communication and be really good at it. So I, when someone is asking a question, for example, on Slack, it's not just a question. It's like, give feedback, uh, make sure everybody understands what they, what you are saying, that they have context. So whenever someone reads this can directly an, uh, answer you because you're not going to be there to clarify some details. You, someone needs all information to answer you because if I'm in Asia and the person that has the answer is someone in the US, what I'm going to do, just be a week com continuously just like slacking each other? No, that doesn't make any sense, right? So one of the things that I did is teaching people really to have this asynchronous um, communication, but like really, really good asynchronous communication and show them what is good and what is not good. And then with that, we have done so much on like the communication and sharing also knowledge in between the team. And then so many people ask me, okay, but what about the team buildings and the team really knowing each other and collaborating with each other? And that's something that's gonna be hard to do, but you can also split things. So for example, if you have a couple of calls a week, um, you can split them and have some ones in the morning so some people can join and then some, some have some others in the evening. So for you as a manager might be a little bit too much, you might say, but that's the only way that everybody can participate. If you want them to participate with you in the room, right? So you just have to commit to that. If you want everybody to be heard, everybody to have some sort of like the same experience. Um, so you just gotta make sure you do that. And also that you get uh, the, the information from one side of the team to the other, very clear and very straightforward. So everybody knows what is going on at all times and recognize what one team is doing in one region what team is doing in the other and share those experiences, right? So not only share, you know, documents and not only share, um, screen recordings, but really, you know, talk about the use cases of other teams to the team that is that they don't work with each other together. Also, highlight what are different people in different teams are good at, so they can reach out to each other and try to enhance this communication, even if it's asynchronously. So these things have helped me so so much, and people is really grateful that you as a leader are making that effort and they see that you're having like different meetings, for example, because then they see, oh, this person is really trying to put us all together and to make sure that everybody is participating in this team, right? Um, so I will say those have been really the most successful tactics that I've used. I love that. Um, and I think that's a really great ending to the session. I know we're about one minute to go. So we really talked a lot about different things throughout this whole journey, right? Starting a little bit about self-reflection, really thinking through what motivates you and, and kind of using that network um, to figure that out as well from your management, your peers, et cetera, things like that. And we talked about really identifying um, what are some of the critical traits that matter? How can you make sure that you, it's aligned with what you really want um, and you get motive, satisfaction out of? I would say also the big thing about leadership is you get a lot less recognition on a daily basis than you do as an IC. So being comfortable with the fact that you don't know if you're doing a good job for a long time, it's really about taking that. Um, and then we talked about the frameworks, the conversations, really being empathetic towards your um, towards your team, making sure that you're building that network to help unlock their potential. Um, and I think the final thing, and some people talked about questions, how do you practice having these conversations? How do you learn from this? All these are great questions, but say for any of you who are interested in this, um, ask your peers, or if you become a first time manager, your peer leaders are a great resource for you. If you've never had that conversation, my first time delivering a really hard conversation, I practice it with a fellow manager who'd been a manager for 15 plus years. So definitely use that community because that's what's great. This community is great for just asking about how they could do that. Let me practice it with you. Um, but with that, I'm going to thank all the panelists, Jeremy, Anderson, Maria for joining, Courtney and Chris for kicking us off. And hopefully the rest of you guys learned a little bit of something from today's session.